Any line that features over 400 different figures in a 12 year period is going to have some Hall of Fame pieces, some average pieces, and some where the punchlines just write themselves. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and these are the 10 worst vintage G.I. Joe action figures. Number 10 is 1998 Skidmark. His name is Skidmark. Can you believe I wrote that joke when I was 12? <laughs> now back to our regularly scheduled brand of action figure comedy for discerning mature adults. Number nine is 1993 Interrogator version two. Interrogator version two is a great example of what makes for a terrible action figure in an otherwise successful line. The colors on the original figure made sense. There was a plan, his look was designed. It's clear that he's wearing a military uniform and that he shops at the same helmet store as Darth Vader. Version 2 takes all of that intentional planned design and fills the molds with colors that look like someone was trying to interpret the photo negative of the character. It's possible that late in the line, as Cobra's cash was running low, they started worrying about the premiums on their insurance policies, so they started enforcing some basic safety procedures to make the troopers highly visible when out in the field. Interrogator is, after all, a helicopter pilot. Number eight is 1992 Dojo. Dojo is Michael P. Russo, and when Mike is out doing ninja stuff, he wears the colors of his people, the people of sunny California. Look, ninja is a pretty generic term, but I assume that someone labeled a ninja as an expert in martial arts in the use of ninja weapons, like ninja swords, nunchucks, and throwing stars. I meant to say numchucks. I accidentally said nunchucks. I accidentally said it right. Yeah. I also assume that a ninja is an expert at covert operations, sabotage, espionage, infiltration, general sneaking around under the cover of darkness. At some point, ninja became a generic term for anyone who does karate, and that's who this is. This is just a guy who is good at karate and has some ninja weapons. I see him at the flea market every summer selling stun guns and smoking cigarettes. This is what he thinks a ninja is. Nothing about this guy's color choices, his rooted ponytail, or that facial hair says ninja. All right, maybe his Ninja Turtle mask, but that's it. Number seven is 1993 Battle Corps Bazooka. The question must have been asked, why don't we have a figure that looks like Bazooka, but if he was just going fishing? I can't even say for sure that this is more casual than his original outfit, a New England Patriots football jersey. The part that makes the least sense is the hand grenade bracelet. I can't imagine that it was A, very comfortable, B, very safe, or C, considered a reasonable or fair fishing practice. Number six is 1993 Battle Corps Leatherneck. Leatherneck wasn't the Joe's first Marine, but he was the first one who respected the uniform. Gung Ho was the Marine Corps rep prior to Leatherneck, but Gung Ho wasn't really about uniforms as much as he was about showing off his sweet Marine Corps logo chest tattoo. Nailed it. <laughs> For most of Leatherneck's tenure, he wore his standard issue battlefield gear, but somewhere along the way his dedication to the uniform wavered and, I don't know, I mean if you have a pair of giraffe pattern pants, you want to wear them to work at least once, right? Hard to blame a guy for just trying to be himself. Number five is 1993 Ninja Force Scarlet. From a marketing point of view, I get it. Ninjas were popular, so let's make everyone a ninja, and let's get a female character or two in there. Comics are comics, and you gotta do what you have to do to move those books. This figure suffers from two debilitating conditions. One, 90s design style, garish colors, pointless straps, and random armor plates. And two, action feature crotch. Can we bleep that? <laughs> Ninja Force action figures had kicking and punching action features that resulted in some pretty awful aesthetics to accommodate the mechanics of those action features, none worse than Scarlet's T-Crotch. Let this be a warning to all, think twice before responding to that Ninja Force recruitment ad. Number four, 1994 Beachhead version three. The original Beachhead from 1986 is a great figure, potential top 10 all time. As the number four in the chain of command, he should be. Beachhead version two is a considerable downgrade with a fishnet mask over his mouth and the introduction of lots of blue to his color scheme. I honestly don't know if there's a real life military application for that mask or if Beach is just trying something out. 1994's Beachhead version 3 takes that downgraded V2 look awash in blue and adds a vest so yellow that the only possible explanation is hazing. Number 3, 1993 and 1994, Gung Ho. Gung Ho has a weird history with uniforms. When he was introduced in 1983, he opted for the shirtless vest approach to show off his previously mentioned gigantic Marine Corps logo chest tattoo. In 1987, Gung Ho was wearing his formal dress blues complete with ceremonial sword. 
But in 1993, Gung Ho fell off the uniform wagon, slipped back into his old shirtless habits, and apparently got his tattoo removed and then replaced with a smaller version of the tattoo higher up on his chest. A vest alone wasn't enough, now it was tiger striped, and he traded in his core issue hat for a headband. And while he went for an all-around darker color scheme in 1994, he again got his chest tattoo removed, and this time had it reapplied to his left bicep. These are not the actions of a man who is coping well with the war on terror. Number two, 1984 Deep Six. Design, designed? Number two, 1984 Deep Six. Designed around his deep diving gimmick activated by a pump that plugged into his back, Deep Six was a two, I repeat, two point of articulation figure. He had to have a special screen built into his shark submersible because he was incapable of moving his head in any direction other than straight down while he lay prone in the cockpit. Yeah, his glass dome helmet is cool and gives him a sci-fi Buzz Lightyear feel, but two points of articulation in a line like this is inexcusable. Now, if he was a moose wearing battle armor, maybe I let it slide. Number one, 1991 Sonic Fighters Road Pig. Like Interrogator, version one Road Pig from 1988 was a good figure. He was a dreadnought dressed up like Brian Bosworth preparing for a life in the Thunderdome. He was armed with a cinder block mounted to an axe handle and a crossbow. In 1991, he was reissued, molded in completely inhuman colors. Colors that make absolutely no sense. I don't know if he's supposed to be radioactive, or have special powers, or suddenly he's an alien. Instead of black gear, now it's all orange. This goes beyond blaming the 90s. This is beyond extreme. There's no figure that would elicit more disappointment after hearing, Hey, I got you a G.I. Joe figure, than Sonic Fighter's Road Pig. He is the worst of the worst. Eight of the ten figures on this list are from the 90s. Five of those eight are from 1993 and 1994 alone. So if you're trying to solve the mystery of who killed G.I. Joe, look no further than the 1990s. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, share this video, and make sure you're a subscriber. You are, after all, the people we make these videos for, not those fat cats in Washington. And let us know in the comments below who your least favorite Joe is. While he didn't make the list, I never cared for Tripwire, of course, but my least favorite would have to be Heat Viper. His whole design just makes me angry. Awkward half-face mask helmet, rockets attached to his boots, and he's not even the flamethrower guy. He's a bazooka trooper. Heat is an acronym that doesn't stand for fire. That doesn't make any sense. God.